Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles, where today we have a pretty special one for you. I mean, hopefully that goes without saying, when you can pick and choose from amongst the best World of Warships players available, hopefully every video is going to be above average. Today's, however, is... well, you'll see. So, this is I Trust Wargaming With My Life, Honestly, at this point, I don't think I'm fooling anybody. It's Flambass. He changes his name every month or so to try to avoid unwanted attention. And he always comes up with a good name. And he is in the Brazilian Tier 10 Destroyer. The Al Yes, I know, Brazilian. <laughs> now, don't look at the Spanish flag on the side. I called this thing Brazilian in my last video. So Brazilian it is. Those are the rules that I just made up. Sorry, Spain. Anyway, yes, the Spanish Tier 10 Super Destroyer. The Alvaro de Mazan, or however you pronounce it. Alvaro? Alva I don't know. Honestly, any Spaniards out there, help the brother out. I mean, I realise it shouldn't be that hard, but, well, you know, I'm English. We don't do other languages. <laughs> we, we don't need to, because everybody speaks English. It's great being English, you should try it. It's like being American, but without everybody hating you for your foreign policies. <laughs> I mean, there are plenty of people that probably should be hating... The English for their foreign policies, but none of our foreign policies matter or make any kind of difference anywhere. So we can get away with it. Yeah. Actually, America is a top tip. You know, for those of you who actually have a passport and occasionally leave the country, if you're having problems with people saying bloody Americans, just tell everybody you're Canadian. That works. I mean, everybody loves Canada. Canada's a very lovable place, you know. Anyway, moving on. So, Flambass in a destroyer. And not just any old destroyer, the effectively tier 11 super destroyer, the Alvaro de Bazan, or however you pronounce it. Spaniards, help a brother out here. The torpedoes. Kinda shit. Long range, but extremely slow and with mediocre damage output. The guns, however, are a different matter. The ship is armed with 135mm guns, pretty large calibre by destroyer standards, and it has eight of them in four twin turrets. And this ship's party piece is the burst fire capability. Now the base reload on the guns is only 5.1 seconds, which is pretty good for 135mm guns. But if you activate the burst fire, it spits out three salvos really, really fast. It does then incur a very long cooldown, something like 20, 21 seconds. Oh, there's the daring. And the daring is a very dangerous ship. Generally speaking, when you activate the burst fire mode, it will tend to result in a net DPS loss, thanks to the long cooldown. However, in situations like this, where you've just popped smoke, your target's only going to be visible for a few more seconds. Situations exactly like that is pretty much what this burst fire or alternate fire mode was designed for. Unfortunately, well, the torpedoes weren't aimed at the daring, but they've gone right by the daring, which means everybody can see them coming. Speaking of which, this, of course, is why he didn't sit broadside on in the smoke screen, because obviously the daring torpedoes were going to be on the way. He's managed to avoid those. Now, this ship gets a very, very basic consumable suite. I mean, it's the bare minimum that you'd expect of a destroyer. It's got smoke, it's got an engine boost, and it's got damage control, and that's it. No Hydro, but in the circumstances like that, you didn't need to have Hydro to know that there were going to be Daring Torpedoes coming. It doesn't have a heal, but it does have a lot of health. I mean, that's nearly cruiser standards of hit points. 30,000. In fact, I know some Tier 7 cruisers that don't even have that much. Yes, Atlanta, I'm looking at you. Oh, I should probably point out, actually, I should probably have pointed this out right at the beginning, that Flambass is not alone here. He's in a division with two of his old friends. We have Enzot 1 in the Stalingrad and Rogue Monkey in the Kleber. The ship that I just referred to was the Klebi Klebi Ikbar. Yes, I'm going to have to explain that one. <laughs> you see, see, in the Royal Navy, when you're visiting all of these foreign ports, it can be a real pain in the arse kind of keep track of the names of all the local currencies. So instead, we just didn't bother. A very typically English thing. If something's hard to do, then you just ignore it and make up your own version. <laughs> so... Uh, everywhere we went, no matter what the actual name of the local currency was, we just called them Klebbies, or Ikbars. Ickies for short. So every time I see the Kleber, I just think Klebby Klebby Ikbar. <laughs> <laughs> I don't expect it to catch on, I'm just explaining my reasoning. Right, anyway, um, <laughs> look, 
the start of this battle was kind of slow. I've got to think, oh, he's spotted again. It's that bloody daring. Right. He's not alone here, though, because he does have Rogue Monkey in the Clevy Clevy Ikbar. Which means the daring is likely to be in extreme trouble here. This time he's decided they're going to go for it. And honestly, they do need that daring dead. There's the burst fire. Daka, 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 daka. The daring's decided, nope, not interested in that, thanks. And the daring's placement of his smoke screen is ideal because it's blocking the line of sight from the other two enemy ships at the back. So he's managed to go undetected. There goes the damage control. Puts the fire out. Gets all of his systems operational. He's going to need to be careful here, though, because he doesn't have hydro. And the Daring does. It's a short-range Hydro, only 3.5 kilometers, but it lasts a long time. And if that Daring was still in the smoke screen, Flambass would be getting hosed down right now. But Flambass is an extremely experienced Destroyer player. And he knows the Daring isn't in the smoke anymore. He also knows that the Daring will be dumping torpedoes into the smoke, which is why he's skirting the smoke screen. The Daring was running for it. There he is. Didn't quite get far enough away. And with Flambass charging in on him, he was never going to get far enough away because the Alvaro de Bazan is an extremely fast destroyer. And the Daring is not. The Alvaro de Bazan has a top speed of 40 knots, and that's before you apply the engine boost. Honestly, with this ship and a Klebi Klebi Ikbar chasing it, the Daring was never going to be able to get away, which was, of course, how Flambass knew that he was no longer inside the smokescreen. The Daring's only chance was to run for the support of his two teammates up there to the north, which of course is why they closed in on him and finished him off as quickly as they could. Ooh, Rogue Monkey's taken some big ass hits there from the Patry's secondaries. However, because the Patry was firing, it's gonna stay detected for 20 seconds thanks to the smoke firing penalty. So, you know, make hay while the sun shines. There it goes. Now, unless the battery fires again, it's going to stay undetected. So somebody's going to have to pop out and spot it. And I think it's going to be Rogue Monkey. Now, do not expect to see Rogue Monkey shooting here. He's only doing the spotting. Flambass is going to benefit from this. One torpedo hit, but the damage was, well, you know, these torpedoes are kind of shit, so the damage wasn't great. But it did disable the steering and cause a flood, which means that guy has just popped his damage control. So, time to set some fires. Off we go. There goes the burst fire. And now that he's incurring that extremely long reload, he's free to leave the smoke. And there's his first kill. Using the burst fire mode, um, I did sort of briefly skip over this earlier, but it is very much a net DPS loss. You fire three salvos and then you incur something like a 20-22 second cooldown, which is reduced by skills like Adrenaline Rush. But the guns have a base 5.1 second reload. So, for the sake of doing 15 seconds worth of damage, instantly you incur a 20 plus second reload. So it's only really going to be useful in circumstances like that. Now then, the Shimakaze. Not a slow ship. In fact, for a while, it was the fastest ship in the game by a substantial margin. But of course, time moves on, power creep affects everybody. But it was the Shimakaze speed there that was preventing him from taking advantage of the smoke screen that he just deployed because he was simply going too fast. Which means that Shimakaze captain doesn't know whether to slow down or just keep going, and he's, um, well, dead. <laughs> Rogue Monkey uh, scores another kill. So with the Patry dead, the Daring dead, the Shimakaze dead, the Slava up to the north there, who's just managed to go undetected. Actually, no, he's just popped up again. That's him over there, ducking in a cover behind the island. Um, he is the only, well, was the only remaining enemy ship over on this side of the map. You could be forgiven for thinking that things are looking pretty good, and superficially, they are. They're ahead by two kills, they have two of the three cap circles. But they're less than 100 points ahead. And if you have a look at uh, some of Flambass's other surviving teammates, like the St. Vincent and the Condor over there, they're on perilously low health. And a single kill will put the enemy team ahead on points. And right now, it's looking like that St. Vincent. 
And there it is. They still have two of the caps though, and they're one kill ahead, but they're not likely to stay one kill ahead for very long, because if you have a look down to the southwest, where the Halland, the Edgar, and the Condor are desperately trying to stay alive, the Halland has just failed, putting the enemy team even further ahead on points. And Flambass has just found himself right within the outer limit of the radar of the Stalingrad over there. Now fortunately, nobody was looking this way, and it's going to take them time to get their guns swung around. He's managed to set a fire on the Stalingrad, and he's trying to set another fire because the Stalingrad did just use the damage control. There goes the burst fire, but look at look at the amount of shells that are shattering. These are 135mm shells. They're not 128, they're not 127, they're not 120. These are big calibre destroyer shells. And almost as many of them were shattering off the Stalingrad superstructure and deck as we're actually doing damage. And that thing's supposed to be a cruiser. <laughs> oh, the enemy Edgar is on fire. I mean, not literally. The Stalingrad is. The enemy Edgar has just achieved his fifth kill by knocking out the friendly Edgar, scoring the Kraken Unleashed, which is going to be real bad news for the Condor down there because, I mean, the fact that he isn't dead yet and the two destroyers are with him are is something of a miracle because he only had about 3,000 health left. The enemy team are going to take Alpha, though, and the team are furiously battling out for defence of the central cap at Bravo. We need some kills and we need them now. Step forward, Rogue Monkey, nailing the enemy Halland. And Enzot taking out that pesky Edgar and putting an end to his five kill streak. Unfortunately, the team do lose the Yamato, so they are still actually behind on points. The only good news here is that they are the only team that actually possess an uncontested cap circle, and they are probably about to retake possession of Bravo in the middle of the map. They have. They're gonna lose Alpha though, but that's okay. They have two caps. They now have to concentrate their defence on Bravo. If they can hold Bravo, they'll win, as long as nobody dies. Now, unfortunately, the Annapolis over there has just seen the torpedoes, and since he's seen the torpedoes, he's about to fire up his radar. Flambass, of course, knew that was about to happen, and he's already taken really big steps away from that Annapolis. But why is he firing at the Annapolis if he's about to go out of radar range? Well, this is a very small, fast-moving target. It's a bit like the Kleber in that respect, although it's not quite as fast as a Kleber, and Flambass is an extremely experienced destroyer player. So he's confident he can dodge the Annapolis's return fire. Where the hell are those shots going? <laughs> Who were they aimed at? <laughs> there isn't even anybody there. Wow, those shots didn't even land in the same postcode. Yeah, like I said, he was quite happy to take the Pepsi challenge against the gunnery skills of the Annapolis captain over there. Well, the Condor has gone down, unsurprising. Um, the only surprising thing about that is that he managed to survive as long as he did on that low health. The enemy team are still ahead, but by a narrow margin, and with two of the three caps under their control, Flambass's team should be able to catch up, providing nobody else dies. There are, however, only three ships surviving. Those three ships, however, are Flambass, Rogue Monkey, and Enzot. They're in the Stalingrad. And if they are to have any chance of keeping possession of this cap circle and staying ahead on points, both Flambas in the Alvaro de Bazan and Rogue Monkey in the Klebi Klebi Iqbar are going to have to work real hard to keep Enzot alive in the Stalingrad. And Enzot, of course, is doing everything he can to maximise his chances of surviving. First, he's in a Stalingrad. It's an extremely tough cruiser. He's bow tanking and reversing away from the Republic, and the Republic has big guns, 431mm in calibre, but the Stalingrad can bow tank against armour piercing shells of that calibre. It's not immune from damage, but it's not going to be citadel from the front. Now if the enemy team could just oblige everybody by attacking Enzot one at a time, that would be fantastic. Flambass here expertly using the Islanders' cover to remain undetected while lofting shells over the top. Unfortunately, he's now just been radared by the enemy Stalingrad. Oh well, spotted anyway, nothing to lose. Rogue Monkey gets a torpedo, there goes the burst fire mode, and there's the kill. And now the Stalingrad's radar is useless, because there's nobody that actually has line of sight and able to fire at anybody. 
ends on, continuing to reverse. Trying to make the most of the health that he has remaining. And the Stalingrad's radar has expired. Russian radar, very long range, short duration. The enemy team do have another radar though. And it's at this point where Flambasser's spider sense starts tingling. Where is that Annapolis? Is anybody trying to sneak around and catch them in a crossfire? Because that would be the smart thing to do. And sure enough, there he is. Now the Annapolis is not a weak ship. We've already seen, however, the questionable gunnery skills of that Annapolis captain. There goes the burst fire mode. The Annapolis had the armor piercing loaded, expecting to catch the Stalingrad in the broadside. Flambas slams on the brakes, causing the Annapolis' second armor piercing salvo to overshoot. He then speeds up again, taking control of the camera here. Enzot, anytime you're ready, nice flat cruiser broadside there for you to shoot at. There it goes. Stalingrad armor piercing. Bitch slaps the Annapolis into the middle of next week. Unfortunately, the Annapolis was able to get a rather punishing armor piercing salvo off with his last gasp. Enzot takes a big old chunk of damage there. The Annapolis probably would have killed Enzot if he'd focused him instead of wasting a couple of his shots against uh, Flambass here and would have survived into the bargain, but hey, he didn't. Unfortunately, with the enemy Slava closing in, I think it's safe to say that Enzot's days are well and truly numbered and he can see it coming. He's going for the ram, trying to take the Slava out with him, which would have been fantastic, but uh, yeah, the Slava's not fallen for that old gag. Torpedoes out. Slava's gone undetected. Oh, hang on a second. There's the Stalingrad. One torpedo hit, but no flood on the Slava. There goes the burst fire. Oh, come on. Come on. The Slava is looking this way. Actually, those torpedoes. He's surely not. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. So much for the Stalingrad. They are now well and truly ahead on points. The Slava has backed off out of the cap circle, so they still have two of the three caps. And the Slava now finds himself in the unenviable situation of being a battleship alone against two destroyers. The thing is, in open water, a battleship facing two destroyers with working brains would be... I mean, just forget it. Eventually, you'd get torpedoed to death without ever seeing the ships that were attacking you. But the Slava is not in open water. There's a lot of closely packed islands here. Now, that works both for and against the Slava, because in order for either of these two guys to actually spot him, they're going to have to poke out from around the side of an island, and they will be so close that the Slava will spot them in return. So that's the good news for the Slava. The bad news for the Slava is that they're destroyers. And even if he kills the destroyer who spots him, it's probably going to get torpedoes away, which he's going to have no chance of dodging. And even if he survives that, there is another destroyer who can just do the same thing again. So what Flambass is trying to do here, and the reason it's not really working until he backs up this far, is loft some shots over the spit of land there. And because uh, he knows roughly where the Slava is, in fact, now he's managed to get spotted by him. Here comes the Slava's armor piercing. Ouch, that hurt, but it was armor piercing. Don't know why the Slava has armor piercing loaded when he's fighting two destroyers, but hey. Sudden rush of shit to the brain there from the Slava player, uh, which I suppose we should be grateful for, but he did get respotted. He's been respotted again. There goes Rogue Monkey. He can see Rogue Monkey. He's ignoring Rogue Monkey because he wants to kill Flambass. Oh well. It's a shame Flambass still has a charge left on his smokescreen generator then, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Um, there go Rogue Monkey's torpedoes. There go Flambass's torpedoes. And now he's holding fire because, yes, the Slava is looking this way. He's waiting for the shots to give him something to aim at. Flambass is not going to give him the pleasure. At least not yet. He selected alternate fire mode. Gets the burst away. Straight into cover, right as the Slava fires, and he has remembered to load the high explosive, but it's a day late and a dollar short, because there he goes. So, another masterclass in destroyer gameplay from Flambass. I don't know why we should be surprised about that at this point. I mean, he did make his name in the early days by playing destroyers and uh, being on the team that won the first King of the Sea tournament, after all, where he was an absolute menace in his gearing. And I don't know why I thought this was a Brazilian ship. I mean, it's the Alvaro de Bazan. If it was Brazilian or Portuguese, it would have been da Bazan, but uh, whatever. 
I'm crap. <laughs> Of course, it wasn't just all about Flambass. He was part of a superstar division here with Rogue Monkey and Enzot in the Klebi Klebiak bar in the Stalingrad, all three of them finishing comfortably more than 2,000 base XP and the top three XP earners on the team. Commiserations, of course, to the poor enemy Edgar, who nearly managed to get 2,000 base experience on a defeat uh, to go with his crack and unleashed. But hey, if you can't take a joke, <laughs> you shouldn't be playing World of Warships. That's it for today. Hope you all enjoyed it. And as always, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.